Members of the Council, guests and friends, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to an address by Mr. Paul Goebel, who is becoming a friend of this Council, having addressed uh, one of our uh, student faculty groups uh, several years ago and having addressed this body uh, about a year and a half ago. The topic tonight is Russia after Chechnya. Can reform survive? And uh, the pace at which the crises uh, appear is, is rapid. Now, Mr. Goebel is known to many of you, but uh, for tho the benefit of those of you who don't know Mr. Goebel or haven't read any of his numerous publications, uh, let me give you a, a brief uh, summary. He's, uh, his Bachelor of Arts degree is from Miami University of Ohio. He graduated summa cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa. His master's degree, I believe, is from the University of Chicago, and uh, he's done work toward the Ph.D. From 1979 to 1983, he was Soviet affairs analyst for the Central Intelligence Agen Agency and the uh, Foreign Broadcast Information Service. From 1983 to 1989, he was an, an analyst and then special assistant for Soviet nationalities in the State Department's uh, Bureau of Intelligence and Research. He also was editor there of Soviet Nationality Survey, and he received the award as INR Analyst of the Year in 1989. 1989 to 1990, he was deputy director and then acting director of the research department of Radio Liberty and also editor of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's daily report. From 1990 to 91, he was special advisor on Soviet, the Soviet nationality problems to the assistant secretary of state for European affairs and also served as desk officer for Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Since 1991, he's been a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where he is now. He's a member of five different boards that have to do with Eastern Europe and his areas of interest there. His publications are numerous. In the last four years, uh, as I looked at his resume, he uh, is co-editor of uh, the book, International Ethnic, uh, uh, Inter-Ethnic Relations in Russia and uh, the CIS, 1994. He's co-editor of that work. He has uh, produced in that same four or five year period 38 chapters and articles and uh, a similar number, 38, op-ed pieces that many of you have read in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Christian Science Monitor, Monitor the Journal, and interestingly, and more recently, the Washington Times, um, which is becoming a much more uh, recognized place to publish, I think. Um, he's, uh, he, he's, he's, uh, he's testified before the Congress on uh, nine different occasions during those uh, past uh, few years. Mr. Goebel uh, uh, has, a, uh, in, in walking from his car up here, um, a number of fascinating new topics have been brought to my attention. Um, so uh, I look forward to, uh, uh, given the fact of what he can produce in 30 seconds, I look forward to the next 40 minutes. It's with a great deal of pleasure that I introduce Mr. Paul Goebel. It's a great pleasure for me to be here again this evening with you. Uh, it is always troubling to get an, a, an introduction that detailed because unless I look quite as old as the woman in the south of France, it should have been, it should have been obvious to you that I have been unable to keep a job. And uh, if you trace the trajectory of my jobs, you perhaps can understand the trajectory of the former Soviet Union, uh, which is not headed in a necessarily happy direction. It's especially appropriate that we should meet tonight to talk about the future of Russia. Fifty-one years ago tonight, Stalin ordered the deportation of the entire population of Chechnya. 
475,000 men, women, and children were loaded into boxcars, and in the next six weeks, one in four of these people died as they were deported from the North Caucasus into Central Asia. In the last six weeks, Sergei Kovalyov, the heroic Russian human rights activist reports, over 24,000 Chechen civilians have been killed, again, men, women, and children, of whom half are children under the age of 15 or women. The number being killed continues to rise each day. I spoke to Grozny the day before yesterday. They're estimating that probably 500 to 600 people are dying each day in carpet bombing. The Russians are no longer bombing Grozny quite so much, which was in any case an ethnic Russian city, but rather the Chechen villages around throughout the Chechen countryside. And the numbers are being obscured by the fact that nobody's there reporting anymore. Chechnya has gone off of page one. It's gone off of the news. We have the O.J. Simpson trial to pay attention to. And what we are watch, watching by not watching is the systematic destruction of a people. And the consequences for that, of that, on Russia and on the West and its possible relations for peaceful, stable relations with Moscow are enormous. It is perhaps not entirely ironic that if the first deportation of the Chechens in 1944 was lost in the noise of the end of World War II and had an impact on Russia only much later, the current Russian effort to suppress the Chechens, and I will argue later they will not succeed, is having an effect already on Russia because the Russia of 1995 is not the Russia of 1944. It is a much weaker and much more unstable place. And the consequences of what Mr. Yeltsin has chosen to do in Chechnya are likely to spell the end of economic reform and the end of a process of democratization in which we in the West had put so much hope. Moreover, it is almost certain to spark a new competition between ourselves and the Russians, a very different competition, as I'll suggest, but one that is likely to be very fateful. I believe that in an important sense, the Chechen events of the last two months, since December 11th, are very much like the explosion that oil uh, prospectors use to set off seismic waves in order to reveal the inner structure, an X-ray, if you will, of the Earth of what's going on. I believe that Chechnya is less important in and of itself, as tragic and as important as it is, but rather important because of what it shows us about what is happening in Russia more generally. And this evening, I'd like to examine very quickly with you three things. First, Chechnya itself, both its unique features because there are some things about Chechens that are totally unique and we should not extrapolate from what has happened in Chechnya to anywhere else. And its general implications because there are some equally important implications that what has happened in Chechnya will tell us about what is likely to happen elsewhere. Second, to discuss Russia's future as a territorial entity because I want to argue with you, for, uh, argue this evening that the borders of Russia are likely to change again and therefore I will give you one good piece of advice tonight, which I've given before. Don't buy any maps. <laughs> buy stock in companies that print them. <laughs> I want to also, look at, under Russia's future, look at its as its pos the possibilities for economic and political reform, which I believe have been severely weakened, not completely put out of order, but se severely weakened in the last three months. And then look at Russia's behavior as a regional power because the use of force in Chechnya is presaging the use of Russian force around the periphery of the former Soviet Union, which most Russians don't think is foreign. That's a major problem which could very well involve us. And finally, the implications of these two things on East-West relations, because right now we are in a stage of massive public denial about what's going on. Uh, since it's not on the TV, it doesn't exist, and so we don't need to worry about it.
But let me tell you that what's happening there is going to affect every one of us and all of our children for the next generation. Chechnya, then. I want to suggest that the Chechens, under President Jokar Dudayev, have already won the battle in Grozny, even though their city is in ruins and that they will win the battle for independence even though the forces arrayed against them appear overwhelming. The question is not whether Chechnya will be independent, but when. That is not to say it will happen this year. But the Chechens, for reasons that we'll see in a minute, are not about to surrender. A Russian colonel was quoted in the Los Angeles Times the day before yesterday as saying he now understood Stalin. It wasn't, it wasn't enough just to deport these people. They should have been exterminated. That is a colonel, serving colonel in the Russian army. That is a very frightening thing to hear you know, five years before the millennium. The reason I believe the Chechens have won is that they have managed to put Chechnya on the map. Three months ago, Chechnya was known only to a few obscur obscurantists like myself. The New York Times couldn't spell it. And Chechnya probably fell within, the, um, fell within what is the famous Red China Syndrome, which, of course, you know is the, the famous story about the woman in Brooklyn, New York, who was asked in 1955 what she thinks about Red China, and she says it goes very well with an orange tablecloth. <laughs> well, the fact is, Everybody knows where Chechnya is now. Everybody has seen that Chechnya is on the map. And that is something, that is an enormous achievement. It is an achievement that most of the countries that emerged out of the former Soviet Union could not claim prior to independence. Second, the brutal and clumsy Russian operation, an operation that was badly led, by people who did not want to fight, that shifted from trying to use tanks in cities, which everyone knows you don't do, to using carpet bombing, killing massive numbers of civilians as soon as you manage to get the Western news reporters out of the city. And what we have with this Chechen resistance is that the Chechens have demonstrated that the Russian story about them is simply untrue. The Chechens are not a mafia. They are not criminals. That there are Chechens in the Russian mafia is true. But there is, as we Americans know, a fundamental difference between saying there are Italian Americans in the mafia and all Italians are mafiosi. Tragically, when the Russians make a similar kind of assertion about others, we don't, we're not so careful. That's why when a year ago in October of 1993, Mr. Yeltsin ordered the expulsion of, quote, persons of Caucasian nationality from Moscow right after he dispersed the parliament using tanks. No one in the West said anything. The expulsion of people because of their skin color, and we said nothing because we didn't want to undermine Boris Yeltsin. Moreover, the Chechen resistance has allowed people to see that President Jokar Dudayev is not a thug. Indeed, in his history, at one point, he actually saved Boris Yeltsin's life. But it is a long story, and I will wait for any, someone to ask me that in questions. <laughs> and most importantly, this is not about Muslims versus Christians. As much as the Russians have tried to portray it that way, because they realize Americans lose whatever backbone they have as soon as you say the other side is Islam, the fact is, Jokar Dudayev is not a good Muslim. He said the other day, I'm a good Muslim. I pray three times a day. Any of you know about Islam? Know that a good Muslim prays five times a day. <laughs> More important, the events in Chechnya in the last three months have called attention to Chechen history and to Russian the Russian response. For more than 200 years, the Chechens have resisted. They resisted in the 18th century under Sheikh Mansour. They are resisted in the 19th century under Shamil. They resisted after the Russian Revolution under my personal intellectual hero, Uzun Haji, who was a four foot two inch tall Sufi Sheikh who went into battle with a banner on which was written in Arabic script, I am spinning a rope to hang all students, engineers, intellectuals, Russians, and in general, all those who write from left to right. He had the kind of comprehensive thinking we need more of. His tomb is 15 miles outside of Grozny. 
and it is significant that the Russians haven't dared to bomb that. In 1933, at the height of Stalinism, the Chechens rose up against Soviet power. It is one thing to revolt against Boris Yeltsin, it is another thing to revolt against Joseph Stalin. And in 1944, as I've already said, they were deported en masse, being allowed to return to their homeland, reduced by about 25% only after 15 years. Their constitutional position is that when the Soviet Union fell apart, they declared independence. The Chechens declared independence three years ago. And for three years they existed, nobody recognized them, but they existed outside of, being, of the Russian Federation. Because they said once the Soviet Union collapsed, the borders inside the Soviet Union had no meaning. And so they went for independence. And for three years, the Russian government did nothing. Why did that happen? Why did they get involved now? Well, nothing in Chechnya in the last three months or the last six months would justify a change. The changes have all been in Moscow. First, there is an oil deal that the Russians are trying to block to keep under control the Azerbaijanis. As I was talking to Dr. Bird, uh, the problem we face is that the Russians right now appear to be getting ready to launch a coup d'etat in Baku against President uh, Aliyev, Gaidar Aliyev. And Grozny is one of the places that oil pipelines pass through. Not only is it important to control the oil that's produced there, but the pipelines. And so the Russians moved. Second, the Russians didn't intend to invade. Last summer, Boris Yeltsin authorized the Russian secret police to go in there and overthrow Dudayev. I mean, it should be an easy task, right? I mean, here's this crazy Muslim fanatic, and you'll just send down some secret policemen, and they'll succeed. They failed. They failed so badly that all the secret policemen were captured. And because they had KGB IDs on them, their names were published by General Dudayev. At that point, the KGB renamed. The KGB went to Yeltsin and said, Boris Nikolaevich, we have a problem. Our men are, under, under, are being taken by this uh, Islamic thug uh, who seems to be able to fight, so you better send in the army. The army then is sent in on December 11th. It does not want to go. You've all read the stories of generals refusing to obey orders. You may not know that the Interior Ministry of Russia has set up machine gun nests behind the Russian front lines, just like Stalin did in the Second World War to prevent people from backing, from retreating. And you may not know that after General Dudayev, President Dudayev, began publishing the names of people he had captured or the bodies he had picked up because they were on the Chechen side of the lines, uh, the Russian military took away the identification documents of Russian soldiers so that their parents would not know they were dead or captured. Indeed, one of the reasons that the military operation went so poorly is that the Russian army consciously used draftees in the first six months of their military experience on the assumption that they would be able to suggest when parents didn't hear from their sons that it was just because boys in the army don't write. And they would be able to spread the reports of the dead over two years, the draft cycle in the Russian Federation. Now, what has Moscow achieved in this? Grozny is in ruins. It looks like Stalingrad, President Dudayev told me by phone, and that's part of the new revolution. All of these people have satellite phones. I have General Dudayev's phone number, if anyone needs it. <laughs> but more importantly, six months ago, Dudayev had about 30% support in Chechnya. He has now 95%. Six months ago, the entire rest of the North Caucasus was opposed to what Dudayev was doing. Now the populations are entirely in support. Six months ago, the other non-Russian regions of the Russian Federation were opposed to what Dudayev was doing. Now they are forming groups to oppose Moscow and demanding the renegotiation of the, the very treaties that various American officials assure us could, quote, solve, unquote, the Chechen crisis. In short, General uh, uh, Boris Yeltsin, President Yeltsin, took a small problem and created a tragedy for himself, the Chechens, for Russia, and for the world. He threw water at a grease fire, which is never a clever thing to do. And he did not understand what he was doing. Now, the impact of all this on the Russian Federation is enormous. Let me take three areas that I think we...
all care about. First is territorial integrity. Second is democracy, economic reform, and will Boris Yeltsin be sober enough to survive? And third, Russia's relations with its neighbors. Territorially, the integrity of the Russian Federation is very much at risk. But the immediate and wrong conclusion that some people are drawing is that the future of the Russian Federation is the past of the Soviet Union. Namely, that the Russian Federation will come apart as did the Soviet Union on ethnic lines. No, I th that's not what's going to happen. What is going to happen in Russia is something much worse. The end of the Soviet Union was the end of a colonial, repressive colonial empire. The approaching end of the Russian Federation is the death of a state, something we have not seen in Europe since 1919 in Germany, something that is fraught with far more serious consequences of the loss of control over weapons and of power. And therefore, we will see the fragmentation of the Russian Federation over the next years, not on ethnic lines, because Russian regions are just as much interested in leaving this disaster as non-Russian ones, but rather regionally, and that will be difficult. In analyzing it, we are, in thinking about this, we are in the position of the blind men and the elephant. We fasten on one thing and extrapolate it. Not everywhere is like Chechnya. The Chechens have been resisting for a long time. Most places don't want to leave yet. And we've got to be careful of assuming there's a single pattern, a single path out of it, and a single outcome, or that any outcome we can des describe is the final outcome. I want to argue that, in fact, what we're going to see is a kaleidoscopic change where, over time where all the pieces are there, but their arrangements keep changing. The trouble with most of the writing in the West is that it acts as if there is a final new steady state we can get to. Here, I want to suggest, to be very quick about it, that the Russian Federation and its future will be defined territorially not by what it is, but importantly by what it is not. Like the Holy Roman Empire, which it resembles in no other dimension, the Russian Federation is not the Soviet Union, it is not Russia, and it is not a federation. And all three of those things have consequences. That it is not the Soviet Union, most people think is a great plus. After all, 80% of the population is ethnic Russian. The non-Russians there are less interested and capable of achieving independence. Only six of the 22 autonomies are in fact have plurality non-Russian population. And the negative experience of the non-Russian countries, the former Union republics, with respect to Western aid and support is such that why go out into the cold world? People are, it is also true that the international community has moved back to Biafra with respect to secession. That is, we are perfectly prepared to tolerate mass murder if it'll keep borders in place. The President of the United States, I would remind you, said in December, quote, we would like the Russian government to solve the problem in Chechnya with minimal carnage. Minimal carnage. That is a truly frightening statement. But the negatives of it not being the Soviet Union are much greater. First, there's the enormous trauma of loss. Russians can't quite cope with having gone from being a very large country to being only the largest country on Earth. They have this sense that they should be bigger. Second, the Russian government was never about laws. It was about coercive power, the ability to compel. And the instruments of control are gone. There is no Communist Party anymore. The KGB is weakened and the army is weakened as the events in Chechnya show, although it is not as weak there as it might be, and it's not as, it, it could be much stronger elsewhere. This has created administrative chaos. There are no laws, lots of decrees, because unlike our country where a law is more valued the longer it stays on the book, in Russia, a law is ignored and a decree becomes ignored. Consequently, both Russian czars and Boris Yeltsin have had to issue hundreds of decrees, frequently the same decree over and over and over again, because only by issuing it anew can anybody take it seriously. Russia, I would remind you, has never been a democracy. It has never had a free market, nor has it ever had the three key experiences which make the West the West. It never went through the Reformation, the Renaissance, or the Enlightenment, and consequently, 
in talking about mo Russia moving to the goals we want, we're talking about a cultural revolution. We're not talking about a recurrence to the past. That is not a Marshall Plan situation where you're talking about countries that had all those experiences and it was only necessary to recreate the infrastructure. Second, the Russian Federation is not Russia. You all know there are 25 million Russians abroad. You may not know there are 30 million non-Russians ethnically living inside the Russian Federation. Well, we don't pay much attention to this. The countries living around Russia do. Moscow frequently makes noises about the 11.4 million ethnic Russians living in Ukraine. They're all citizens of Ukraine, I should tell you. And when they do this, the Ukrainian government has taken to pointing out that there are 7 million plus Ukrainians living in the Russian Federation. And to quoting Vladimir Nabokov's classic novel, Pnin. And Pnin, as you'll recall, was an emigre Russian professor who never learned English quite right. And so he bollocked up our sayings. And the one he used the most frequently, which is now the cornerstone of Ukrainian policy with respect to Russia, is to say to Boris Yeltsin whenever he raises the issue of ethnic Russians in Ukraine, quote, people who live in glass houses should not try to kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> <laughs> but another way it's not Russia. 53% of the territory of the Russian Federation is nominally under non-Russian control. It's in the 22 non-Russian autonomies. That's like having everything west of the Mississippi be an Indian reservation. That might be an improvement, but it would also have psychological consequences. Especially if we had to give Alaska back to uh, Zhirinovsky. But the most important reason about this that it's not Russia is that no Russian sees the borders of the, of the Russian Federation as the borders of his country. They were defined negatively, that is Stalin drew the borders of all the other places and what was left was the Russian Federation. And Russians were given extraterritorial status, that is they got language institutions abroad outside of the Russian Federation. And so no Russian in Soviet times would have said I'm from the Russian Federation. He would have said I'm from Moscow or I'm from the Soviet Union. An Estonian would have said, I'm from Estonia. A Ukrainian would have said, I'm from Ukraine. That absence of Russians defining themselves in this term means that Russians constantly make noises about how we should get it all back. It means that the Russian government cannot use nationalism in the same way that others do, because to play up Russian nationalism ends up driving aggression. And the Russian state might now just be weak enough not to be able to do much about it. Indeed, I think the Russian state is in the position of the famous teenage boy who calls his girlfriend and says, I love you so much, I'd climb the highest mountain, I'd swim the widest sea, and I'll be over tomorrow night if it isn't raining. <laughs> and that's terribly important. All of that rests on the fact, too, that the Russians, in contrast to the European nations, are a state nation, not a nation state. That is, this Russian state became an empire before the Russian people consolidated as a nation. As a result, the Russian identity is rooted in the strength of the state. When the state is weak, people feel there's nothing they can hold on to. It is a threat to who they are. <clears throat> and I think we would all agree that a Russian government that now presides over an economy, which is roughly 5% that of the United States, even though it has 45,000 nuclear warheads, is a much weaker entity than the Soviet Union conceived itself to be five years ago. And it's not a federation, quickly. Federations require law. They require the agreed shared upon a power, not the division of power with one side grabbing as much as it can, but agreed upon sharing. That's not what we have, and that makes every, every movement to regional autonomy look like secession, and every movement to gain, re take power at the center look like an effort to suppress democracy in the periphery. I believe there are three key areas where we will see secessionist movements emerge over the next five to ten years. The first is in the middle Volga and the North Caucasus, largely Islamic. The second is in the Russian Far East, and along the Russians and the Urals, it should be pointed out, you say, these are Russian areas, how can they secede? Very simply, the Russian Far East is already issuing its own money. And in October, it announced it was going to sell Russian military equipment on its own territory and pocket the profits. That's, if California did that, I, well, <laughs> at this point, I think let them go. But I mean, uh, uh, we might not view it that way. <laughs> 
the, and the third area is the area for those of us who like the obscure and the exotic, Buryatia and Tuva. For those of you who are stamp collectors, Tuva is the most important. It will now reemerge, and I trust you have all ordered your new Marx and Lenin stamp from Abkhazia, advertised in the papers the week before last. But what are the consequences for democracy and economic reform? And for Yeltsin. The problem we have is that we have talked about these things as if these were intellectual games, rather than about struggle for power. As if everybody could simply agree that democracy and free markets are the best possible solution, rather than some people saying, uh, we get democracy, I lose. We get free markets, I lose. And fighting it about power. Instead of analyzing it as a power question, we've analyzed it as a question of morality. I don't think any of us would disagree that democracy is the best form of government and that capitalism is the most efficient way of organizing an economy. But to say that is not to convince anybody who's doing better when neither of those exists. And our mistake is to thinking because they're morally better, that's a solution. The situation for democracy, for economic reform, and for Yeltsin are all bad. Democracy, we've now seen Mr. Yeltsin is prepared to resort to force, and every time you do it, it gets easier. Second, the Yeltsin regime is increasingly authoritarian. You may have read the newspaper reports that Boris Yeltsin has now banned advertising on Russian television. And some people thought that was about control of the free press by not letting people advertise. No, it was control of the news media by making the news media totally dependent on state financing. This is about controlling what we learn about that society. Moreover, we have an increasing Camarilla court politics. It's not the public which runs things in Russia. 74% of the Russian people were against Chechnya. In most countries, that would be enough to stop it. It wasn't. It is one, the only silver lining in the Chechen operation, and that is that the Chechens have brought out the best in the Russian people, just as they brought out the worst in the Russian government. Thirty years ago, an emigre Chechen Sovietologist, Abdurrahman Afterkhanov, observed that he didn't object to calling the Soviet Union an industrial society, not because there wasn't any industry, but because there wasn't any society. Thankfully, times have changed. There is a Russian society. Tragically, it doesn't control the government. Moreover, the parliament is increasingly dominated by an alliance of old communists and Vladimir Zhirinovsky's nationalists. Tragically, the only two people who uncritically supported Boris Yeltsin's behavior in Chechnya were Vladimir Zhirinovsky of the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, another Holy Roman Empire example, and the Clinton administration, which I find offensive as an American. And what we have with Yeltsin is a bunch of his tennis partners, his drinking buddies, running state policy, much like it was at the end of the Russian Empire in 1916 and 17. Indeed, when I hear about some of these things, I think of Pavel Milyukov, the great Russian liberal Democrat's observation in November 1916, when he compared in the Duma Russia's situation to be li like the person riding in the back seat of a car being driven by a drunk down a mountain road. The challenge is, are we more likely to go off the edge if we try to take over the wheel, or are we more likely to go off the edge if we don't? That is where we are. Boris Yeltsin is drinking so heavily that he is functional. It is now estimated only two to three days a month. The rest of the time, he is very drunk. The, be the things you have seen on TV of his conducting the German military band, his staggering uh, in Almaty, are being replicated day in and day out locally in his behavior. He has shown up drunk at diplomatic receptions when he has shown up at all. He didn't in Ireland, as you know. And he consi insists on drinking, and it is drinking plus medication for his back that explains where he is. I personally think Boris Yeltsin will be in office in 1996. I do not think Boris Yeltsin is currently in power. I think he remains in office because it would call into question the disposition of lower offices were he to be pushed out. And the people who are right below him don't want that to happen. The economy, 
Well, since the United States is a proclaimed Russia democracy, it's also tended to proclaim it a free market economy. Let's get empirical. Private investment. In the first half of 1994, for every dollar of foreign direct investment that went into Russia, $346 left as assets were sold off. Foreign direct investment fell from $250 million positive in September of 1994 to something below zero in January. Budget gap is way up. They expected 13 trillion rubles in, in, in tax revenue in January. They got 6 trillion. And that's in the context that last year, only 15% of the taxes owed were collected. That may be everybody's dream at this time of the year, but it doesn't work. <laughs> the Russian government in January expected 9.1 trillion rubles from the privatization of firms. They got 13 billion rubles. That's nothing when there are now 4,400 rubles to the dollar. The cost of Chechnya plus the cost of past mistakes is adding up. Inflation is now running at an annual rate of 600%. The ruble is falling 20 points, 20 rubles to the dollar each day. There are two stories that go around Moscow. First, Radio Armenia is asked, what is the rate of exchange between the ruble, the dollar, and the pound? Radio Armenia answers, it takes a pound of rubles to equal a dollar. <laughs> the other is suggested by a friend of mine who teaches in Washington that the true comparison of the ruble's value is to point out that it now takes three rubles to buy an Italian lira. <laughs> Privatization, which we are all celebrated, at least Mr. Talbot at the State Department does, has been massive but of the wrong kind. 95% of the new owners of corporation are ex-KGB or ex-nomenclatura. What was done was to hand over property to the party and state officials who controlled it earlier and to call that capitalism. Or to distribute vouchers to workers who had a vested interest in inefficiency. Because if you're a part owner of a corporation, you don't vote yourself out of a job. And the risks are getting greater. In Janu and January 24th, Boris Yeltsin was finally convinced to get rid of Minister Vladimir Polivanov, his privatization chief, who had said we should renationalize a bunch of things. But just so you'll know that his dismissal doesn't mean very much, three days later, the mayor of Moscow, Mr. Lushkov, renationalized private cable TV operations in Moscow. And we have begun to see renationalizations elsewhere. In all these cases, it is because there is no law, there is no structure. The old KGB is mixing with the new mafia, taking advantage of the situation. And I don't know how many of you read the LA Times, but there was a wonderful example of just how far this has gone. The ex-deputy director of the National Security Agency in the United States operates a security firm. The chief of his Moscow office is the ex-chief of counterintelligence for the KGB. He gave an interview to the LA Times and said, you know, Businessmen sometimes have problems in our country when they're foolish enough to get guards who aren't ex-KGB. But we're professionals. And when people know that the KGB is on the job, they tend to stay away. That is privatization. And the relationship with the neighbors, and I'm running out of time, so very quickly, while Russia is relatively weak, it continues to make threatening noises and put enormous pressure on these countries. We can go into it each, each region. The Russian government has not accepted the independence of the countries of the former Soviet Union. 74% of Russians believe that Ukraine should not be an independent country because Ukrainians are not a separate nationality. The only one that is viewed more or less as independent, I guess, is Estonia on the assumption that no one would want them back. Um, the Estonians have a, have a wonderful way of, put, of causing the Russians grief when the president of Estonia showed up to meet Boris Yeltsin last summer to negotiate um, the withdrawal of Russian troops from Estonia. He pointed out to the Russian president that the president of Estonia and the president of Russia had a lot in common. And Yeltsin, who was carrying two bottles of vodka at the time, said, uh, Mr. Mary, what do you have in mind? And uh, Leonard Mary said, uh, well, we both spent a lot of time in Sverdlovsk. That's where Boris Yeltsin was born. That's where Leonard Mary's family was exiled in 1940. Okay? Now, what is this all going to mean on our relationship? Very quickly. 
The tragedy of the relationship between Moscow and Washington, between Russia and the West, is that we were oversold how good it could be and how well, how easy it would be. It has been overpersonalized. We focus on first Gorbachev and now on Yeltsin and go down with the ship both times, having overinvested to the point that we can't let go of him because we'll drown, and allowing him then, both leaders, to exploit the, the incredible power of weakness. I keep a cartoon from June of 1991 over my computer screen at home. It was when Gorbachev went to the G7 meeting in London to try to get aid for Russia, but it works now. It shows Gorbachev in the guise of a bank robber holding a gun to his head, telling the bank clerk, give me your money or your friend gets it. <laughs> and moreover, we have underfunded what is going on. A billion dollars is a lot of money in Estonia, where you have a million and a half people. A billion dollars in Russia, where you have 150 million, is $6.60 a head. If you're going to make a difference using money, it's going to take a lot. And we have decided not to do that. As a result, the Russians are increasingly angry at us because they thought they were promised something and it hasn't been delivered. And as a result, they are sticking their sticks into our wheels at all possibilities. You will have read that Russian Foreign Minister Kozarev in Belgrade told Milosevic to hold out for the lifting of sanctions before he made any agreement on Bosnia, exactly the opposite of American policy. You will have, been, will have heard about Russia's planned sales of nuclear reactors to Iran and its offered sale of a nuclear reactor to North Korea. Again, very much against American interest. And you will have heard about Boris Yeltsin's outburst at Budapest against any NATO enlargement, allowing him to dictate, to determine what the boundaries of that alliance, which he is not a member of, should be. There are serious questions about NATO enlargement, which we can talk about. But our problem is that we're responding, we're, tr we're so tied to Yeltsin that when he goes down, so will we. We have expected too much for the last five years. We are now walking away. It would be far better for us to accept that the two countries will always be two powers, will always have to deal with each other, but will always be different. And by promising too much, we, make our, we put ourselves in a position of having to make concessions, in order to maintain the relationship, or alternatively, that any difference becomes the basis for breaking the relationship. Now, this doesn't mean there's going to be a new Cold War. The Cold War was based on an ideological competition. The only thing the Russian state can offer today is Russian nationalism, and as you know, the nationalism of one country seldom attracts a lot of adherence anywhere else. A few coterie intellectuals, but it's not like communism. There may be a few intellectuals in America who will like Russian nationalism so much that they'll buy into it. But it will not be a Cold War competition because Russian nationalism is self-limiting, not only because of the weakness of the state. And so, we can, uh, can, let me conclude quickly. Our approach to Russia has been to proclaim victory and then go home, to announce that it's over so that we don't have to do any more. And tragically, that is how democracies deal with victories in war. I'd like to end by reading you some very wonderful language that was written by Winston Churchill in a book called The Aftermath, where he attempted to explain why it was that after the victory over Germany in 1918, Anglo-America turned away from the world, refused to get involved, and the disasters that caused. He writes, to the faithful toil-burdened masses, the victory was so complete that no further effort seemed required. Germany had fallen, and with her the world combination that had crushed her. Authority was dispersed, the world unshackled, the weak became the strong, the sheltered became the aggressive. The contrast between victors and vanquished tended continually to diminish. A vast fatigue dominated collective action. Though every subversive element endeavored to assert itself, revolutionary rage, like every other form of psychic energy, burnt low. Through all its five acts, the drama has run its course. The light of history is switched off. The world stage dims. The actors shrivel. The chorus sinks. The war of the giants has ended. The quarrels of the pygmies have begun. That was written in 1929. 
Four years later, we had Hitler. Ten years later, we had the Second World War. The weakness that Russia displays today is not the weakness that we will see a decade from now. But the problem is that we don't want to have to give at home because we claim we've given at the office so much. We are now, and I would just end with a personal anecdote which tells you how I think this is working out. For much of the Chechen crisis, I've been a commentator for Canadian and British broadcasting. And ten days ago, two weeks ago, I was called by CBC. They said, we'd like you to go on with your regular commentary on what's going on in Chechnya. And I said, great. They said, be there at three o'clock. At two o'clock, they called and they said, uh, Ms. Goel, uh, we don't need you anymore. Um, the O.J. Simpson trial is back on. <laughs> and uh, uh, we're sorry, but uh, our producers are going with that. I think that kind of self-absorption, that turning away from the world, that, being unwill that unwillingness to face just how dangerous the world has become, and it is more dangerous to now, now than it was 10 years ago because of Russian weakness, because the likelihood that Russian generals will control nuclear weapons, because of the certainty that there has been nuclear leakage out of Russia, and that it is in Iran, it is in Libya, it is in terrorist groups in Western Europe. The world is a very dangerous place. It will not be made safer by denial. But as Churchill suggests, denial is the order of the day after any victory. The Chechens have won a victory too. Let's hope that it doesn't become our defeat as well as Moscow's. Thank you. What is President Clinton's visit to Russia? Um, as you know, in January, during the height of the Chechen conflict, President Yeltsin, once again violating international practice, publicly invite, invited President Clinton to visit Moscow on May 8th for the uh, VE Day, the Victory in Europe Day in Moscow. Uh, invitations like that are not issued publicly without clearance, clearance in advance unless there's a political purpose. Mr. Yeltsin clearly wanted to force uh, Mr. Clinton's hand uh, and get him to agree to come. And there would be President Clinton standing among the generals who just committed mass murder in the North Caucasus. And that was not a picture which Mr. Clinton wanted to see on television. I'm convinced that Mr. Clinton will go to Moscow sometime this spring or early summer, but it will be on any day but VE Day, so that he does not have to be photographed with Russian generals. I mean, this is, that's what it's about. That, that Con consider the way that would be used against him. Would I be a bit more specific on what I would think U.S. policy should be toward that region, uh, given where we are? Well, in 40 minutes, it's possible to explain the world but not explain American policy. Um, but let me, let me tell you what I believe. I believe that the United States should be interested in supporting free markets and democracy, not in that order, in Eastern Europe, the old Eastern Europe, Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, the Baltic countries, and further east where possible. I believe that we should fasten our attention on those countries rather than on Russia. The administration tells us that if Russia goes bad, everything else will go bad. It does not, it never admits that the converse is true, that if everything else goes bad, Russia will go bad. And it, it doesn't, it, I, would, I would be in favor of much more support for democracy in Eastern Europe. I would also back off from the sort of neo-Marxist view that if we get the economy right, everything else follows. Uh, I think Russia can, might very well be a capitalist country someday. I don't see it being a democracy in my lifetime. And I'm not sure that strengthening the economy of a country that is likely to be authoritarian and actively opposed to us in many spheres makes a whole lot of sense. On the other hand, I mean, there is, an, there is another hand in these things. I am appalled that the United States government has not tried to relieve the suffering of the Russian people. In the last 25 years, life expectancy among Russian males has fallen 11 years. It is now 59 years. Why? Because infant mortality and child mortality is skyrocketing. Why? 
because nobody's willing to go to a hospital or a doctor and get a shot. Why? Because the average disposable syringe in one district in Moscow was used 267 times. The risk of infection. We can do something about that. Getting 10 billion syringes into Russia makes sense. Getting food to people who are starving makes sense. Getting medical equipment to people who are starving makes sense. Having cooperation with their secret police doesn't make sense, in my opinion. And I would have ended that the day Chechnya happened, rather than have it continued and celebrated. I, would, I think the Russians should be told that we are interested in having them join the West. We are interested in having them integrated into Europe, just as we had Germany integrated into Europe after World War II. But that will only be possible if they learn to play by the rules of the game that everyone else is expected to follow. Tragically, instead of sending that message, which might integrate them, we have a Deputy Secretary of State who goes around quoting a minor 19th century Russian poet and police spy, Fyodor Chuchev, who said, Russia can't be measured by an ordinary yardstick. In Russia, it is possible only to believe. Well, that's like saying all the rules apply to everybody, but they don't apply to Russia. I think that's exactly the wrong message to be sending them. I, and I think we are, we are setting ourselves up for a fall. And that scares me, because they still have 45,000 nuclear warheads. And that's something we've got to worry about. The question is, he, he's asking for a clarification about my statement that uh, Yeltsin banned advertising on state television. Uh, and he's saying that the Baltimore Sun reported that Boris Yeltsin banned only alcohol and, and tobacco advertising. There were two different acts. The first action, which was reported in the Baltimore Sun and, and in the Washington Post and other newspapers, was to ban the advertising of alcohol and tobacco. And that was everywhere, not just on television, but on the, um, uh, you know, billboards and in magazines and everything. That won't be obeyed, but he get issued the decree. It's probably not even constitutional, but that doesn't matter too much. Then he issued a second decree, which is a day later, which has not been widely reported here, having to do with advertising on television, extending from that decree about alcohol and tobacco to everything else on television. Again, I don't think it'll be implemented, but that's what has happened. No, you're quite right. There was a decree one decree which has been reported. I'm talking about the second decree. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. The question is, uh, I paid a pic I'm said to have paid a picture of imminent collapse of the Russian Federation. Is there anything the United States can do to prevent that? First, this isn't going to be imminent. It's going to take a number of years. We want drama. We want it to happen all in 30 minutes and be solved. Uh, this is going to be far messier because it's going to take far longer. And we're going to see ups and downs and bumps, and it's, it's going to be a very, very ugly ride. Uh, become a nationality specialist, it's a growth industry. Now, the question, is, the question is, can the United States do anything about this? I don't think so. I think there are two things about, or three things about this that I want to say. First, we Americans are used to thinking that we're in control of everything, that nothing in the world happens or doesn't happen unless we do something or don't do something. No, we're used to thinking that way. The fact is, we now have to confront forces, and I purposely use the geologic image to begin with, because I think these are tectonic plates moving around, that we can't control. Second, I think the United States could have made an enormous difference three years ago. I think former Secretary of State James Baker, from whom, whom I under whom I resigned from the State Department over the Kiev speech, was absolutely right when he said in the beginning of 1992, the United States had been given a unique opportunity to restructure the world in ways that would serve the interests of the United States and guarantee peace into the next century. He did not then add, but we plan to punt. <laughs> a billion dollars of aid in 1992 would have made an enormous difference. To get the same achievement now would take hundreds of billions. We're not prepared to do that. 
We could have made a big difference early and cheaply. We chose not to because we were in an election cycle and then we had a president come to power who believed he was elected not to have a foreign policy, okay? <laughs> the third point I would make is that while, the United, while we usually think of the Russian people as our enemies, the Russian people were never our enemies. They loved Americans. And why? Because the American Relief Administration under Herbert Hoover in the early 20s and Lend-Lease in the, in the 1940s kept millions of these people alive. And you won't meet Russians who won't remember those things. Tragically, my friends, the United States is managing to do something that I, even I didn't think was possible. That is, make the Russians hate us. Because there is a rising tide of anti-Americanism at the official level and elsewhere in Russia. First, they don't want to be pushed around, especially if not being given any money. Second, they want to strike out and prove that they're strong, they're tough. I mean, this behavior of Kozarev in, in Yugoslavia is an obscenity. We should just tell the Russians, you do that, no more money, period. No IMF, no nothing. But we won't, and we didn't. I think what is really frightening to me is that we are watching the emergence of a genuine anti-Americanism. It's still not everywhere. It still could possibly be reversed which will be exploited by a Russian government. And that sets the stage for all kinds of disasters down the way. What would I do? Well, if I had been Secretary of State in January, uh, no, it would take a revolution for that to have happened. Uh, if I had Secretary of State in January, I would have said, the, the government and people of the United States wish to express their solidarity with the Russian people who have spoken out against this war overwhelmingly. The government and people of the United States equally want to register their outrage at the violation of a whole variety of international law and moral principles by the Russian government. You've all had the extraordinary uh, experience of uh, an evening with uh, Paul Goebel. And uh, it always is one of the most uh, interesting of times. Uh, you never fail to be uh, educated and stimulated uh, and always to feel that you're in his debt. Thanks so much for joining us.